Hi, Doug. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, members of the public, committee members. Um, we're going to start uh, on the new proposed home ownership. I don't have the exact title down or in front of me, but Maura Collins, who's uh, Vermont Housing Finance Agency, is charged with implementing and running that program, which I understand was proposed by the governor in budget adjustment, I think, but was not put in the Budget Adjustment Act as it came over to the Senate. So with that brief introduction, we'd like to learn more about it. I don't think, we, I don't think we've heard a lot about it at this point. Um, and I guess a preview for me anyhow, and for other folks is we're, you know, we're dealing a little bit outside the boundaries of a typical Budget Adjustment Act that usually tweaks what happens what happened in the last budget for changes in spending or need for more money uh, and doing potentially starting new programs within the Budget Adjustment Act. And we're doing that, I guess it's being suggested in a couple of areas in housing because there's so much pressing need for housing. Uh, I think it's in my own feeling, we need to go judiciously in that direction where the substantive committees don't get to do a thorough review. We're told that the Budget Adjustment Act has to be out by Friday, at least on the money issues. So with that uh, pessimistic note, Maura, I'm turning it over to you. Up for the challenge. My name is Maura Collins. I'm the director of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Thank you for squeezing me into what looks like a very full agenda. So I'm gonna move quickly. Um, Senator Sorokin was right that the governor proposed $5 million for a new homeownership construction program in the Budget Adjustment Act. Um, the House uh, heard the testimony and I think didn't, um, didn't vote against it, but thought that, um, as Senator Rockin said, um, proposing new programs in the Budget Adjustment is unusual and they wanted to um, take more time and think about the um, implications of starting a new program. The governor has proposed another $10 million in the FY23 budget. I believe his overall goal is however, it, whichever vehicle it comes to be that there be $15 million um, spent on homeownership construction through ARPA funding. And um, I believe the reason the first bit was proposed in budget adjustment was in recognition of the pipeline of projects that developers and builders have uh, underway or available coming online um, this spring or starting this spring and wanting to send a signal to the building industry that um, there was uh, funding available, which I can um, speak to what the program is next. I'm going to share my screen very quickly to um, show you that there are there have been many investments in home ownership over the years um, from the state. Uh, you can see some examples. I'll run through um, a few projects that um, we have long with the support of the legislature through the state home ownership tax credit program. We have long um, run a homeownership development program. East Branch Farms are 20 newly constructed duplexes in Manchester within walking distance of a shopping center that um, were sold using, um, they have the shared equity model, but were funded through uh, the state homeownership tax credit program and were brought online over several years. Um, you can see that we've um, funded homes in Cavendish, several in um, Chittenden County. We've in total done $18 million of construction loans VHFA has to nonprofit and for-profit builders and developers in our state. We, the legislature expanded the state's tax credit program from just being a rental development program to home ownership in 2009. And over that time since then, um, we've overseen and administered the investment of $14 million of equity through that program. Um, a lot of those have been manufactured homes that um, Champlain Housing Trust administers through their manufactured home replacement program. 
um, but the balance of the money, but just over 6.6 .6 million has been in stick built homes in 25 different communities. You can see this is a very old picture of Safford Commons in Woodstock um, that is notorious for its decade long permit battle, um, but does house um, uh, many homeowners in Woodstock, which was a great success. And um, Dalton Drive is on the Essex Colchester line and it's the historic rehabilitation of Officers Row, which is on bus service close to healthcare and amenities. Uh, I just want to remind the committee that um, there's a lot of programs VHFA runs with federal dollars that frankly doesn't flow through the legislature and uh, we don't get in, frankly, we don't spend enough time talking about and informing you of. Um, an example was after the last financial crisis, uh, there was federal funds that VHFA administered in total about $10 million dollars. Um, where we would purchase foreclosures from lenders, work with homeownership centers and builders and trades folks to rehabilitate them with an eye on energy efficiency and then sell them to income qualified buyers. And those homes remain affordable going forward. The initial program ran from 2009 through 2015, but once we used up all the money, now our role switches to one of monitor and um, we produce regular reports and, and watch the resale of these homes over time. This was really designed to be a neighborhood um, stabilization program from the feds, which was administered through VHFA. Um, again, the tax credit program uh, expanded. You, you added homeownership as an eligible activity in 2009, but then in response to Tropical Storm Irene, it expanded again. Um, to cover the Manufactured Home Replacement Program. I do think this is a program you hear about often, and so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but you can see that it's gone to help um, 263 manufactured homes so far, which are all Energy Star rated, if not net zero. Uh, I'm going to stop my screen share there so I can see your lovely faces. Um, there is a handout in your... Um, in your files under my testimony, um, it does show, um, actually, you know what, I'm going to share my screen one more second. I apologize. Yeah, but wait, you're right, Lamar, it's all posted on our website under today's date, the documents. Yeah, and you'll see um, this chart on there. This shows, I've showed this to you so many times, you're probably sick of it, but I, I can't tell you how important it is. When I get asked by reporters, as I was again last week by VPR doing another brave little state story on housing. Um, they keep saying, why do we have this housing crisis? And I keep pointing to, because we aren't keeping up with producing the homes that we need. You can see here, the 1980s weren't even one of our biggest growth decades, but you can see then, even then we were adding just about 3,200 primary homes a year uh, to our housing stock and every decade, that annual rate of increase drops off. And so in the most recent decade I'm showing on this chart, we were adding just about 400 homes a year. And I, I'm excluding vacation homes. There was more construction happening then, but I think this program and, and this committee and definitely VHFA as an agency is mostly focused on primary homes for Vermonters who can purchase them. Um, and this is, not just a Vermont problem, um, this is an, a national problem. Uh, we know that America is short between five and seven million homes nationwide, but you can also see what this has done on this map um, that Vermont has one of the highest in the top 10, well, bottom 10 states, however you say that, of um, having the greatest home price appreciation in the nation. And so this pandemic has, propose unique challenges and we've come up with what we think is the best solution um, to this problem for this particular crisis that's been thrown at Vermont. So the problem is, is that it's too expensive to build a modest home that's affordable to Vermonters. We have a strong framework for new investments that builds off the historical and ongoing success of state investments into building homeownership opportunities, which is what I just um, ran through quickly in those slides. 
So we know how to meet the home ownership needs in Vermont. We're building off these existing models and adjusting them to today's market, which is what this program proposes. Uh, this program was spurred by the survey and the forum that we held this summer with builders and developers that I spoke about a week or two ago when I was uh, last in front of this committee. Uh, they really talked a lot about the barriers to home production. And so the approach in this pilot program was informed by conversations with Vermont's builder and banker communities and continues on um, as they frankly hear us testifying about it and get excited about um, learning more about the program. Although this is designed to be a pilot and a new set of approaches, we will be engaging even more with a broad audience of home builders and banks and credit unions to continue to shape the final mechanics of the program. And I think that that is where, if I had to say, um, you know, why the House Com uh, Appropriations Committee's um, uh, was thinking that this wasn't done being developed was that they wanted all the answers of how big will the homes be? What will they cost? How will it work? What will the profit limits be? And we've been talking about how we will be setting all those limits through a public process. That is the way VHFA typically designs our programs. We administer $36 million a year that doesn't go through the state house through federal tax credits. And in doing so, we do that through a very transparent public process. Uh, we have to have a public document, which is in a nerd terminology called the Qualified Allocation Plan. And in that, we have to publicly propose what the priorities are going to be, how the priorities of the funding are in alignment with the state's housing policies and plans, how we're going to define um, downtown developments. Does that just mean in a designated area or does that mean within a half mile walking radius of a designated area? Which of the five designated areas counts and should they all count equally or do we really want to treat village centers and designated downtowns as different from new town centers and growth areas? These are the detailed conversations that I think are best had in a public forum where builders, developers, nonprofits, and advocates can grapple with these conversations so that we can come out with the best outcome. In the end, there are two elements of what is being proposed. One is proposed to be funded through the BAA. The other is currently a request to VHCB. They have a board meeting tomorrow and their staff has recommended $2 million to go to VHFA so that we can support banks and credit unions who provide construction loans for home builders. And we would look through various formats to guarantee those loans, maybe through uh, deposit access or participating in construction loans with the lenders so they don't have to take on all the risk, but somehow to backstop those construction loans, which carry some risk with homeownership development, and because VHFA would put this $2 million to work in this way, it would lower the cost of the construction loan and that savings could be passed on to the home buyer. That is not a part of the BAA request, but it's an important component so that you know that when we were hearing from builders, this was one thing that they really raised was that they um, had to set aside too much money upfront cash, deposit it with the bank just to backstop and protect the construction loan that they were applying for. And putting their money aside and having to leave it there for uh, risk capital was too expensive for them. So by using these public funds to do that and that we can use these public funds, that's going to help lower the construction loan costs. The BAA request is for a subsidy program that's going to address two kinds of gaps we see in building homes. One is the value gap. The reality that one can, in, in many communities in our state, build a home, but it will cost so much that the minute the last nail is hammered in or the paint dries, that home may not appraise for the full amount that it costs to build it. That's a reality that it, in some of our communities costs, in the example on my one pager that uh, your committee has, it costs $425,000 to build a modest home. 
but it's only going to appraise for 375,000. That value gap needs to be covered if we're going to bring more affordable homes to market. And this program would pay for that. Additionally, $375,000 may be too expensive for some of the targeted households we're trying to serve. And so we can choose to also cover an affordability subsidy that could buy down that purchase price even farther to serve a lower income Vermont household. That affordability subsidy we're proposing would stay with the home in the form of a land covenant, which Vermont has many decades of using. And it would be a, a silent uh, subsidy at the home that would stay there and could be available to future buyers if they're income eligible. It would not grow with time. It is different from the shared equity model. So the home buyer, when they go to sell, they would not share in the appreciation. They would take the appreciation, but the public funds would stay with the home and be available for the next buyer. There's also parts of the state where that uh, value gap isn't so much a problem. And um, there's many parts of the state where we're focused much more on rehabilitation instead of new construction. And this program would cover both new construction or rehabilitation. I can appreciate this in all of your um, counties, but you know, I'm looking at Senator Brock, knowing that there are some towns and, and cities that uh, really need new construction, but then there are many communities that need money to repair and bring back to market vacant housing stock. And so this would be available there too. The, the amounts of money that would be available to cover the value gap or the affordability gap would fluctuate and be nimble based on the needs of that development. Just like every application that VHCB or VHFA or DHCD funds, we would look at and do a full financial underwriting of that proposal and determine how much is, needs to go to the value gap, how much would be needed for the affordability subsidy. And that we would cap this assistance at 35% of the total development cost. We got that standard based on a federal tax credit program that was proposed in Build Back Better, but obviously has not passed yet because Build Back Better hasn't passed. But we are trying where we can to mirror this program to what we see developing at the federal level so that I'm a hopeful girl. If there's ever a day that federal tax credits or funds are available, we could use this to leverage with that and grow the program even more. Additionally, I think leverage is important. We do have existing programs in our state as I rolled through very quickly in my slides to support homeownership development. And we would like to see this program be developed so that it could complement other funding. It could maybe be paired with the state tax credit if we were going to try to reach really deep affordability. It could be a tool for the shared equity model to access so that there had to be less subsidy to buy down that affordability to the sweet spot of where their program serves. This pilot is designed, as the governor has um, deemed it, a mi middle income, missing middle income proposal. So it's really saying that it would serve at the bottom end, maybe 80% of median income up to 120% of area median income. I think 80% is gonna be hard without leveraging those other subsidies. I think maybe starting at median income is probably gonna be more realistic about what we see, but I'm never one to put a floor on an income limit. If, if there's some way we can serve very low income with a homeownership program, that's wonderful. I just wanna recognize that it, it really would take other subsidies to pair with this to get to that point. Laura, can I interrupt? Yeah. Um, yeah. Are you close to being done? Very close. The last thing I wanted to say was just the reviews that we would do as an agency in the administration would include uh, reviewing land costs for reasonableness, um, like I said, putting limits on the size of the homes, the cost per square foot, and uh, the profit that a builder developer could um, have. And in that, um, 
know that this would remain a flexible, nimble program as markets change. And we don't know what coming out of the pandemic is going to look like for the home building industry. And this kind of flexible resource would be critical so that we can make sure that we're responding to that changing market. Thank you. Uh, we're really pressed for time. Uh, I um, Have you presented to the Senate Appropriations Committee? Yes, I think that was last week. Okay. Um, so I'm, I guess overall, in addition to the concern that the House may have had about specifics of this program, I'm also, you know, if, if we were able to do full due diligence, I would want to know why we need another new program. It seems like we have other programs that are targeted similar things or could be tweaked or expanded to cover this as opposed to establishing a brand new program. One of the things you mentioned sounded very similar to what was suggested in S79 in the home ownership uh, rehabilitation revolving program uh, for a million dollars. I don't know that that's started and maybe this is that's the governor's not still pushing for that, even though there's a million dollars sitting there in the budget right now. But I just I'm starting to feel like there's a, this. I, I realize putting together deals for uh, housing development is complicated, and we have to draw from a lot of sources. But it does start to seem that um, I mean. Just, I know it's too simplified, but it's really a, a subsidy program to help somebody afford a house uh, that they can't afford at the building costs right now. And why can't that be factored in some, in some other existing program as opposed to creating a whole new program? So I, I'm just expressing, I'm not expecting uh, an answer or a very long answer, but I I guess my feeling is that I have that concern as well as the specific concerns that the House Appropriations Committee have of specific parameters for the program. And finally, I would say that, you know, the difference between budget adjustment and the budget, if you make sections of the budget uh, effective upon passage, maybe two to three months, uh, and there is also, as you know, we're doing this omnibus housing bill. There's also that bill where something like this could potentially go in. So the, diff, the delta between what you can get in better budget adjustment and what you can get from a separate standalone bill may be even less than two to three months. So uh, I'm feeling that sense of discomfort at this point. But I'll stop there and ask if any committee members have questions. We have a very full agenda this morning. Uh, I'm not sure we can get more back, but if you have questions, I mean, we're going to have to make a recommendation. I think Jane has asked me for a recommendation on this program, which as you can imagine, uh, based on a half hour testimony, we're going to set, set off a $5 million program is a little unusual for a legislative uh, due diligence committee. I can't see everybody. Let me check. Is there any shout out if anybody wants to ask a question of Mora? Okay. Mora, any last words? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if there is, if you have some availability this week, there may be some more time, but I'm not, I can't guarantee it. Thank you for your time. I look forward to talking about this more under the budget request because, and it would be great to think about this under the omnibus and or the budget. And I can answer your questions at that point about how this is similar, different from that revolving loan fund you mentioned and the other programs that exist in Vermont. We can talk about that then. Good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Maura.